Hello Keyboard friends and family. Welcome to my review of the Geonworks F1-8X. This particular unit being the F1-84 because it is wing keyless. Now the Geonworks F1 is a Korean custom, so that's custom with a K, that uh, was uh, produced earlier this year and was available for the early bird price of 318 US dollars. Now, this was only available to Korean buyers, and thankfully, a good friend of mine, Bombworks, was able to get me a unit at retail price of 318. I will link his YouTube channel in the description, and he gets to touch a lot of cool keyboards, and you should check him out. Now, the standard price for this, the non early bird price, is about 370 US dollars which is still fantastic for what the keyboard is. Now, looking at the keyboard, we can see that it is a stereotypical classic Korean design with a little bit of a heavy emphasis on the top and bottom bezels due to its mounting structure, which is a leaf spring gasket mount. Now, the keyboard sits at about an eight degree angle and is of a seamless design. And its most notable feature is, of course, the sextuple, that means six, internal brass weights. So it's a pretty special keyboard and uh, we'll find out why. Let's roll the intro. And here we are at my incredibly messy desk to take a look at the case externals. Now the case externals are fairly simple. Uh, stereotypical Korean sides of about five millimeters with a pretty wide top and bottom bezel. Uh, this is due to the gasket mount leaf spring structure, which we'll take a look at once we get into the internals. Uh, overall, the top is very clean. There's no engravings, no external char characteristics. Overall, very basic bitch design, which I am a big fan of. Looking at the back, we can see it is a seamless design, mostly. Uh, the top case doesn't protrude all the way down, so it's a less classic seamless and a more modern seamless. And uh, what we've got here is uh, a double recess. So you've got your first recess and then a secondary recess before we get into the USB-C port, which normally I'm not the biggest fan of, but in this case is kind of acceptable, I guess. It works with all of my USB cables, so I'm not really complaining. So here we can see my terrible fingerprints, and this thing is a little bit of a fingerprint magnet, at least with my fingerprints, as my fingers are literally the worst, which is why I'm wearing gloves for this video. And uh, the sides are nice and clean. I like the side design. It's nothing spectacular. The, uh, the bottom case, which holds all six weights and accounts for about 2.6 kilos out of the uh, 3.5 kilo total built weight, uh, comes up at a slant, which uh, is the same angle of the top case, more or less. The case bottom is very clean, very simple, where we see the six feet. These are either rubber or silicone and house the six case screws. And in a TKL, the six case screws is something I really enjoy. Uh, in terms of the anodization and finishing. Uh, first of all, my original unit was going to be a gray unit, and uh, I opted to not get a gray unit as the uh, gray anodization was a little bit problematic. Now, this was Gion's first keyboard, and for the price that it was sold at, we have to take this review into context. For the price, this is spectacular finishing. However, the finishing is far from spectacular overall. Now, it might be a little bit hard to see on camera, but we can see some striping here. And here you can see these horizontal lines. Now, generally, this could be a aluminum extrusion problem, but it could also be an anodization problem. In either case, for the budget, this is spectacular finishing. We can see, you know, some small little splotches here and there. Nothing major. Overall, looks pretty good. And the same goes for the black anodization. We can see a little bit of striping going here, going here horizontally, and it's a little bit noticeable when it curves here, but otherwise it looks pretty good. 
Uh, the top case, there's a few markings here and there in the anodization that are really, really, really hard to catch on camera, mostly due to my terrible fingerprints. But let's hop into the macro cam and see, let's see if we can see anything more. So here we are on the macro cam and at the smallest scale, it looks fantastic. The chamfers are super well done and generally what we're looking for when judging uh, finishing on the edges is we want to make sure there are no white areas, no little scratches, uh, no issues during the finishing process and alongside the machining angles and it looks pretty darn good all the way through. That's probably just dust. Yep, there we go. It looks fantastic. We can see here on the macro cam a little bit of discoloration along, uh, along the black anodization. Again, we're zoomed in so much that uh, on a macro cam, you'll see it, but with the naked eye, it looks fantastic. Uh, one thing I wanted to hit on while we are still here is actually the screw areas. So within or under all six of these feet, we can see the screw mount location. And I really like the attention to detail with the small little chamfers on each of the three ledges before we get the screw in there, which looks fantastic. I love the attention to detail here. And we can see that the fitment of the top and bottom piece is pretty darn good. And if you look very, very closely, especially at the uh, silver bottom piece, I'll get my finger out of there, on the edges, you can see another very small chamfer. And this is a reoccurring thing we're going to notice with this keyboard that, oh boy, does it have chamfers. So let's take a look at, actually, let's, uh, let's go ahead and disassemble this and get into the internals and talk about those. Alrighty, before we get into the case internals, there's another thing I wanted to show you guys really, really quick, and that is the immense amount of chamfers on the plate. Now, as my unit is fully built, it'll be really hard to tell, but each and every single switch cutout location is chamfered. Uh, this, is, this is a byproduct of the way that it has been manufactured. And uh, I'll try and link uh, a little blog post that Gian had posted about it, which I found really interesting. So essentially the way that it's done is the entirety of the plate uh, is anodized as a single sheet of aluminum, uh, after which it is crimped, which we'll talk about. Uh, the crimping is for the, uh, for the leaf spring mount locations. And then the entirety of the plate is machined. And at which point, if you're already uh, CNCing the entirety of the plate, it gives you the option to chamfer every single cutout, which I think looks fantastic. And this is the very first keyboard that I have ever seen with chamfered cutouts for every single cutout in the plate. All right. Now let's tear it down. Tear down on this keyboard is exceptionally simple. This keyboard makes my life very, very easy. And all I need to do is remove the six feet and remove the six screws. There are only six screws required for the entire assembly of this keyboard. Okie dokie. One last thing before we get into the case internals, one of the most important part of my YouTube reviews is of course, the screw review. Very important. So let's take a look at our screws. Now, generally when I'm doing a screw review, I'm looking for a few things. I'm looking for the finishing on the screws. I'm looking for how rugged the screws look. And these screws look pretty darn rugged. And the last, and in my opinion, the most important piece is I'm looking for uh, black dirt or grime on the very ends of the screw. Uh, now, this is something you'll see in a lot of keyboards, and this is caused by improper cleaning of the screw taps after manufacturing. Uh, 
It's a very important step in the quality control and assembly process where a uh, group by runner will have to clean the insides of the threads. Uh, generally, this is done with screws. And we can tell that these screws are pretty much brand new. These were not used for the internal cleaning processes, which says that this has been quality controlled very, very well. And overall, the screws look pretty good. Uh, they're nice and sturdy. Haven't had any problems with the screws. Uh, there's no rust, none of that. And finally, let's look at the internals. Now, if we look at the case top, we can see that there are little rubber gaskets. And these came with the kit as a singular long rubber gasket that can be cut to size. And if I were to snake this out a little bit, I'll show you guys what it looks like. There it is. It's a standard black rubber gasket. Feels decently hard. Might be a 60A or around there, maybe 65. And these are cut into the place and put into little grooves on the case top. And once you've put them in the grooves, they kind of stay there, which is pretty cool. Now, in terms of the top case, while we're still here, uh, we can see the six screw points. Nothing fancy going on here. What we do see is that the inside, uh, the inside, uh, the inside finishing looks quite different from the outside finishing. Notably here, where we can see quite a bit of texture. Again, this is not an issue at all. It's just intriguing to see that the internal texture is completely different from the external texture. Now, I'm not sure what would cause this, if it's a uh, sandblast of uh, internal and external uh, variants, or if it's something else. But it is quite interesting. You guys can see that texture right there, especially on the bottom part, essentially. It's a vertical texture. We can see a few smaller machining points which are just very interesting to see, especially in something at this price point. The fact that this piece sits lower than this ledge piece, which in terms of the design is not absolutely necessary. So this is just a small little bonus that you get by getting the keyboard made to this level of caring. And we can see a similar thing here with the inset USB port. Uh, this could have been machined much less cleanly but it just looks spectacular the way that it is. All right, we've got the next major point, which is the mounting slash building experience. Now, the first time I built this, it took me quite a bit of time to figure out how to do it. And it was quite a little finicky to put together. However, once I learned how to properly do it, it takes about a minute to take apart or put back together. My issue was, these black little gaskets that sandwich the plate in place. So these had to be cut to size and during assembly, it's kind of hard to keep them in place when you're trying to put the keyboard together. So like you try and put this in here, make sure it's flush and doesn't try and sneak out. And usually one of these pieces will fly out as you're trying to do the same as you try and get it all, you know, aligned. But Overall, like I said, once you learn how to put it together, you're pretty much good to go. Now let's go back to the chamfer view. Look at that. Look at this small little chamfer going all the way across the entirety of the plate. Look at that. It's just fantastic to see. Even, even on parts like these, where it's not even important at all to have chamfer. Uh, here, let me point it out. Parts like these here where, wow, that's just amazing to see that level of attention to detail and these lovely cut corners instead of going with, you know, something more rounded. I, I really like the angular cuts here. They're quite nice. But it's crazy, crazy levels of CNC. Now, the way that it mounts is fairly simple. What we've got here is a plate with a leaf spring. So this area here, the bright silver area contacts the gaskets on the top and bottom and attaches to the plate via a rather rudimentary uh, 
leaf spring mount, essentially. Uh, I had some issues with it, as uh, this part here bends very, very easily, and mine actually came bent when it arrived, uh, which could have just happened during transportation. I was able to bend it right back. It wasn't an issue. Uh, the reason why it's so essentially flexible is because this is a 5000 series aluminum plate versus a 6000 or a 7000 series. And uh, before anybody complains in the comments, yes, it is possible to make a plate like this in 6000 series since it is full CNC. Overall, though, it's just a crazy amount of cuts everywhere in the plate. Everywhere you look, it's spectacularly done with chamfers in every single possible location. And we can see a little bit of uh, laser work here where it says designed by Gion Works. And uh, this was also done in-house. So uh, like I said, I purchased this for uh, standard retail early bird pricing uh, through a Korean friend. And uh, Gion had found out that I had purchased one and was kind enough to send me uh, two lasered uh, Simon Face keycaps just to show me how his laser works, just as a gift. And it was very sweet of him, and I really appreciate that. Now, of course, we're, we're reviewing the keyboard, which, of course, I've paid in full for. So normally I don't take free units or keep free units or keep review units or anything like that. All right, on to, we're going we're gonna to save the brass, pretend there's no brass, on to the internal machining of the case bottom. There's quite a few things here that I really, really enjoy. Uh, first of all, we can see these holes that go all the way through the keyboard. And that allows us to mount these silicone feet. Uh, realistically, he could have gone with a smaller silicone foot and uh, avoided this. But uh, realistically, you don't see this hole once it's fully assembled and have the feet in. I just found it a little bit strange, but it's something noteworthy. The second thing is these square and rectangular uh, cutouts, which serve a couple of purposes. Uh, purpose number one, or purpose number one is they look really, really cool, and they have been machined very well. Look how beautiful the machining is on that. Obviously, we're looking at this through a macro cam, so these small little dings you can see are things you cannot see with, you know, the naked human eye. Uh, the second purpose that these actually do is they allow the plate to slot into place with very little movement. So this is a way of restricting your plate movement when doing a gasket mount. Uh, traditionally, when you see things like these, uh, they're generally used to, uh, to position the bottom piece to the top piece. But in this case, uh, they're not used for that. The top and bottom is simply just fitted to uh, allow one to fit onto the other quite nicely. All right, finally, we've got the sextuple internal brass weight. Now these look fantastic, in my opinion. Uh, I'm a big fan of a nice heavy keyboard and brass has some, uh, some good sonic properties when it's installed on the internal uh, part of a keyboard, uh, notably to do with uh, reducing the reflectivity of the alpha, uh, the alpha bottom out sound. Uh, Lots of people would prefer an external brass weight, but I really prefer the internal brass weight as my fingers are cursed and are very, very sweaty. So uh, if they were exposed on the bottom, if I were to touch them, they would turn brown and patina very, very quickly. Uh, the alternative to this is to do some sort of finishing on the brass weight, uh, but most finishes still patina over time. Uh, even super well-applied PVD and electroplating, uh, assuming it has a few dings in it here and there, will allow air to get in and then it will patina on the underside of the machining. All right, in addition to this, we see the machined grooves for the gasket landing areas, which essentially span across the entirety of, of the case, which is pretty cool. And then we've got our lovely little stylized cutout here for where the USB port sits and USB port assembly sits. And if we look very carefully, we can see how these here are inset a little bit and those match up perfectly to the extrusion on the case top. And it's just so beautiful when you see something like this just fitting all together. I'm a big fan, I'm a very big fan. And then, finally, the most important part of any keyboard is the PCB. 
Now, for the vigilant of you, you will notice that this is not the PCB that comes with this keyboard. This is a PCB from the Jaguar TKL. And uh, I disassembled my Jaguar with the express purpose of assembling this keyboard because the original PCB is terrible. So here we've got the original PCB that came with this keyboard. This is the Fave 87 made by LX3. And dear God, this is the worst PCB I have ever used on any keyboard to date. Its only saving grace is that it has a USB-C port, but honestly, at this point, I'd just prefer if it didn't exist. So uh, I'll list a few issues I had with this PCB. Uh, Issue number one is it's not compatible with the latest version of the Fave software, which already doesn't work on a lot of people's computers. So this is not VIA or QMK. This requires that you download a horribly optimized Korean software to reprogram it. And essentially what I had to do was find some ancient version of the software that allowed me to finally you know, look into the PCB and reprogram it and it took ages to figure this out. Issue number two, which is the, the most amateur issue I have ever seen on a PCB, is when I was remapping my keys, I noticed that my escape key was mapped to escape. But generally, you have two escapes. You have your 60% escape and you have your TKL or full size escape. So a 60% escape means if you press shift escape, it makes the little grav, the thing above the tilde. But then that means you cannot do shift escape. It's just not a thing. So normally in your key map, you include a standard escape key. So I can switch to a standard TKL escape key. So I can do shift escape. So for those of us that you know uh, use that key combo a lot to mark things as red in a variety of softwares, it is purely not possible on this PCB, which is hilariously bad. I mean, China figured this out 10 years ago. I'm surprised Korea hasn't figured this out in 2020. Uh, the third and you know final major issue I had with this is the debounce timer. So uh, most PCBs allow you in their firmware to set how long your 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 debounce length is, and what that does is it makes it so uh, when you press a key once, it doesn't accidentally think you've pressed it more than once. So what it does, it'll only parse that key for a certain amount of time. The issue is, if I turn down that amount of time to the minimum, so the lowest it can possibly go, I run into issues where I'm typing uh, words with two recurring letters, like good or full. So anything where I'm pressing two keys really quickly, it'll only register it once. And I don't realize it until five words later, and then I have to go back and, and delete my text and fix everything like the idiot that I am. So after using this for about one day, I took it and I threw it away. It was quite bad. So word to the wise, if you get yourself an F1, uh, consider upgrading to a Heine 87C PCB and you'll have a much, much better time. Uh, again, for the price point, I am totally okay that this keyboard came with that PCB. However, dear God, it is unusable. Alrighty, so that's, that is the entirety of the case internals, and let's move on to a typing test before we get to our main summary.
All right, next up, I want to talk about the Korean maker culture and how much of a breath of fresh air it has been to see such a nice, well-priced keyboard coming out of an up-and-coming Korean maker. Now, a fair portion of new Korean makers enter the hobby with the intention of making money instead of making a really good product. And a lot of the old Korean makers, which I've discussed in depth during my Lin Will 2 review, my standpoint was that the prices keep increasing while the quality control and the finishing have a lot of work to do to get up to Western standards. This is a fantastic keyboard and Gion has a lot of cool stuff planned, being the F2 for the international release, as well as a leaf spring tray mount 65% that I'm very interested in seeing. Now at this point, Gion has only made one good keyboard that I have tried, and one does not make a pattern. So there is a potential for Gion to be one of the biggest, most influential, nicer makers in the global community if he continues to put out keyboards at fair prices and at this level of craftsmanship and quality. Now, the F2 is targeted to be around 450, and I hope that he can hit that 450 price point, which should include a hard case, just like the hard case that came with the F1. So that's something that remains to be seen, but I am very hopeful in terms of the future. And I hope that more makers come out of Korea and other places in the world that really truly care about the hobby before they care about money. Alrighty, let's get into the actual final summary. Now, We'll start with the three main points of any keyboard. We've got the aesthetics, we've got the sound, and we've got the feel. Now, in terms of aesthetics, considering the context being the price, the aesthetics are spectacular. I love the weight. I personally love the design. I'm a big sucker for basic bitch Korean style rectangles, and I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. The anodization and uh, chosen uh, aluminum extrusion could be better, but again, at its price point, it is beyond spectacular. Next, we've got the sound. Now the sound obviously sounds very Korean. That means high pitch and quieter. And I had originally built this keyboard with uh, SP star linear gray switches that are kind of a higher pitch chirpy switch. And it wasn't really a good combo, so uh, I rebuilt it uh, with milk top Gateron linears looped with 205 grade zero, which sounded much, much better. Uh, now, if you're more into Western sound, that being, you know, lower pitch, boomier sound, maybe you won't like this that much. However, the user can still tune the acoustics by choosing particular switches, looping them in a particular way, and using particular keycaps that try and bring out the target sound profile that they're going for. So in terms of sounding like a Korean board, 10 out of 10. In terms of sounding like a Western board, obviously it'll never sound like a Western board. And finally, we've got feel. And feel is actually something that's very interesting with this board, considering its mounting structure. Uh, the fact that it is a leaf spring gasket makes it very bouncy. Not flexy, as gaskets do not make any keyboard flexy, they make it bouncy. Uh, what this means is while typing, once you bottom out a switch, you feel the plate come back at you, which gives you the impression that your switches are more responsive. It's very, very subtle and very minute, but everybody that has tried this keyboard agrees with me that you feel the plate bounce back at you. And it's not a uncomfortable thing, it's actually a very interesting thing that makes it feel really crispy, really fast. And I really, really enjoy that. Now, uh, Gion had sent me a plateless conversion kit prototype to test. And traditionally, I love flexi builds, I love plateless builds, but the only issue is this plateless kit is only compatible with the stock Fave 87 PCB. And I threw it on the ground, so. That's out the window. Uh, I'd like to see how other people enjoy the plateless conversion kit. 
see if they really enjoy it. Maybe somewhere down the line, look at a plateless conversion kit that you know fits other PCBs, notably Heine PCBs. That'd be fantastic. But in terms of feel, it feels great. Uh, to be fair, I mean, I've got a nice selection of boards that I thoroughly enjoy. And since assembling my F1, I've been daily driving my F1 and I've been really, really enjoying my F1, even compared to things like my TGR Jane 2 and my CE and my, you know, other boards that I really enjoyed before. The F1 is amazing for the price. And just like all other Korean keyboards, I'm going to give you guys the same advice, which is don't overpay, cap it at 450. And if you can't get it for 450, wait for the F2. And if you can't get that once it releases, then consider getting a future keyboard by the same maker. Maybe you won't get it on your first try, but it's a lot better than paying $1,000 for a keyboard that should be worth less than half. So that's pretty much my entire review. If you like the video, drop a like. If you want to see more keyboard content, consider subscribing, consider telling your mom, and I'll see you guys on the next one.